Sure, they got more down there. All right. Well, ready? Yeah. Okay. Well, good to see everybody here this morning, and uh, I see uh, everybody's relaxing <laughs> really nicely. Anyway, this is the place to come and relax and to enjoy our fellowship and time together. And if you're joining us online, we want to thank you for being here. And we're glad that you're here and, and uh, willing to go through our study time together. It's uh, time to praise the Lord, isn't it? But before we actually get into that, uh, we're going to open with prayer and then we'll have our story time. And who we, who are we uh, talking about now in our story time? Who can remember? Brother Andrew. Okay, Brother Andrew. And I'm a tablet here. I find that kind of interesting. <laughs> Well, I'll try that. It's just harder to get up and down on this side. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, let's, uh, let's bow our heads. Father, we want to thank you once again for life this morning. You've given us a beautiful day in which to worship you. We want to thank you that everybody arrived here safely. And we hope, Lord, that those who are joining us online, that wherever they might be, that they too may be enjoying their day. We want to thank you for the opportunity to open your word, to learn more about you, uh, more about your love, your kindness, and your long-suffering. Uh, Father, we know we're, we're living in turbulent times, and we're asking that you would come and you would be with us as only you can. Uh, we, we, we need to learn more what it means to rely on you. And we know that the Spirit is going to be poured out in our lives, and so we're experiencing that on a daily basis, but we're looking for that latter rain power. And so we're pleading for that. We know that's what we need. And so we, we're asking that you might bless us in that regard. We want to thank you for all the things that we've been able to accomplish thus far. The, uh, the literature that we're sending out, we pray, Lord, that you would bless that. We know there are others in the area doing similar things. This is the time to make uh, a marked effort in reaching souls for the kingdom. So thank you for using us in that regard. And uh, bless uh, each person that ends up uh, receiving something in the mail. <clears throat> Before we begin our story, we just uh, want to ask that you forgive us of our sin, our faults, our failures, and help us, Lord, in all we do and say, even think, to lift you up that others might be drawn unto you. If there are any others on the way, we pray you bring him here and that we might experience together what you have for us today. And we ask all of this in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Okay. We're on chapter 2, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Yes, we're just starting chapter 2. All right. Tell me a little bit about what you remember about last week, what happened last week. Anybody? Am I, am I close enough to get a good sound here? I think so. All right. I'm waiting for this to fire up. I should have had it already up and running. I'm running the time schedule this morning. So let's see. You picked up the story. What was happening in his life when he was a boy? What was the time frame? The World War II. Okay. And where did he live? He, he was, uh, he was, uh, the Germans were, were getting ready to come in, and... Actually, we covered all the way through World War II with him, didn't we? Yeah. Did I sleep through this thing? Did you not hear them going through World War II last night? I don't know, I must have been asleep. Remember when he was putting the firecrackers out and scared, startling all Oh, yeah, that's right, I remember that now. <laughs> yeah. And they grabbed him and... Typical. And he had the firecrackers in his hands. hands. Yes. And they searched him. Yes. <laughs> and the sugar in the gas tanks. Yeah. I remember that. That's then. what you call the, the Dutch resistance. <laughs> I guess I was awake. This chapter is called The Yellow Straw Hat. Oh, yeah. <coughs> the calendar year in which they turned 18. I wouldn't be 18 until May of 1946. But in January, I was back, and this time I was accepted. Before long, I was strutting through Vita in my new uniform, oblivious to the fact that the pants were too big, too small, the jacket was too big, and the whole effect quite top-heavy. But I was going off to take back our colonies for the Queen and perhaps get a few of those dirty revolutionaries that everyone said were communists and bastards. The two, the two words, 
automatically went together in everybody's conversation. The only people who didn't respond with applause were the Westras. I walked top-heavy past their house. Hello there, Andy. Good morning, Mr. Westra. How are your mother and father? Was it possible he didn't see the uniform? I turned so that the sun glinted from my shiny brass belt buckle. At last I blurted out, I've joined up, you know. I'm going to the East Indies. Mr. Wetzler leaned back as if to see me better. Yes, I see. So you're off for adventure. I will pray for you, Andrew. I will pray that the adventure you find will satisfy. I stared at him puzzled. Whatever did he mean, adventure that would satisfy? Any kind of adventure, I thought, as I looked over the flat field stretching away from Vita in every direction. Any adventure would satisfy me more than the long sleep of this village. Should I go on to this a little bit? Yeah. Okay, so I left home. I left home emotionally as well as physically. I worked hard during basic training and felt for the first time in my life that I was doing something I wanted to do. Oh, how I liked being treated like an adult. Part of my training took place in the town of Gorkum. Each Sunday I would go to church, not because I was interested in the service, but because afterward I could count on being invited to dinner. I always enjoyed telling my host that I had been picked for special commando training in Indonesia. Within a few weeks, I would say, dramatically pushing my chair back and taking a long draw from my after-Sunday cigar, I shall be hand in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy. And then, striking a somewhat distant look, I would ask if my host would consider writing me while I was overseas. They always agreed to. And before I left Holland, I had 70 names on my correspondence list. <laughs> One of them was a girl. I met her in the usual way, after church, a reformed service that particular Sunday. She was the most beautiful girl I had ever seen. About my age, I guessed. Extremely slender, with hair so black it had a tinge of blue in it. Mm -hmm. But what impressed me most was her skin. I had read about skin as white as snow, but this was the first time I had ever seen it. After a pleasant snooze during the sermon, I went invitation fishing. Sure enough, I timed my exit just right. Snow White was at the door. She introduced herself. I'm Tilly, she said. I'm Andrew. My mother wonders if you would like to have dinner with us. Very much indeed, I said, and moments later I left the church with the princess on my arm. Tilly's father was a fishmonger. His home was over the shop, down by the waterfront in Gorkum, and throughout, throughout our dinner the pleasant smells of the dockside mingled with the odors of boiled cabbage and ham. Afterward we sat in the family drawing room. Cigar, Andrew, said Tilly's father. <coughs> Thank you, sir. I chose one carefully and rolled it in my fingers, as I'd seen the men in Vita do. Frankly, I didn't like the taste of cigars, but the association with manhood was so strong that I could have smoked rope and enjoyed it. Throughout the coffee and cigars, Tilly sat with her back to the window, the strong midday sun making her hair more blue than ever. She hardly said a word, but already I knew that this young girl was going to be one of my correspondents, and perhaps a lot more, too. November 22, 1946, my last day at home. I had already said goodbye to Tilly and the other families in Gorkum. Now it was time to take leave of my own family. If only I had known it was the last time I would see Mama, I would have been far less of the dashing soldier going off to war. But I didn't know, and I took Mama's embrace as my due. I thought I looked rather well. At last the uniform, I had a uniform that fit. I was in excellent physical shape. My hair was close cut army style. Just as I was ready to leave, Mama reached under her apron and pulled out a little book. I knew right away what it would be, her Bible. Andrew, will you take this with you? And of course I said yes. Will you read it, Andrew? Can you ever say no to your mother? You can do no, but you can't say no. I put the Bible in my duffel bag as far down as it would go and forgot it. Our transport ship, the Sibijak, landed in Indonesia just before Christmas, 1946. My heart raced with excitement at the heavy tropical smells, the sight of naked porters moving up and down the gangplanks, the sounds of the hawkers on the dock trying to get our attention. I shouldered my duffel bag and struggled down into the fierce sun of the dockside. I did not guess that within a few weeks I would be killing children and unarmed adults just like the people who crowded around me now. A few of the hawkers were selling monkeys. Each was held by a little chain, and many had been trained to do tricks. 
I was fascinated by these little creatures with their serious ancient faces and stooped to look at one more closely. Don't touch him. I straightened up to find myself facing one of my officers. They bite, soldier. The officer was smiling, but he was serious. Half of them have rabies, you know. The officer moved on and I withdrew my hand. The little boy who was holding the monkey chased after the officer, shrieking at him for ruining the sail. I moved back into the line of debarking soldiers, but right then I knew I had to have a monkey of my own. Those of us who qualified were separated from the rest of the troops and sent to a nearby island for training at commands, training as commandos. I liked running the, through the tough obstacle courses, scaling walls, swinging across creeks on vines, crawling into culverts, wriggling under machine gun fire. Even more, I liked the hand combat training where we worked with bayonets, knives, and bare hands. Hi, hi, ho! It was lunge and parry, thrust with fingers stiff, come at the enemy with drawn knife. For some reason, the thought never penetrated that I was training to kill human beings. Part of the education of a commando was the development of self-confidence, but here I needed no schooling. From childhood, I had a completely unfounded confidence in my ability to do anything I set out to do. Like drive a Bren carrier, for instance. These were the heavy armored vehicles mounted on caterpillar treads, and handling them was difficult even for someone who could drive an automobile, which I could not. But each day we went out on maneuvers and I watched the driver of the carrier on which I rode until it seemed to me I had the hang of it. Unexpectedly one day I had the chance to find out. Coming out of company headquarters I ran into an officer. Can you drive a brand carrier soldier? A quick salute and an even quicker. Yes sir. Well that, that one there has to go to the garage. Let's go. In front of us at the curb was the carrier. 300 yards away was the garage. Seven other carriers were parked there, nose to tail, waiting to be serviced. I hopped snappily into the driver's seat while the officer climbed in beside me. I looked at the dashboard. There in front of me was a key, and I remembered the driver always turned that first of all. Sure enough, the engine coughed once and then caught. Now, which of those pedals was the clutch? I pressed on one of them and it went to the floor. I knew I had been lucky twice in a row. I put the carrier into gear, let go of the clutch pedal, with a great kangaroo leap, we launched into space. <laughs> the officer looked at me quickly, but said nothing. No bread carrier ever starts smoothly. But as I raced full throttle down the company street, I noticed he was holding on with both hands and bracing his feet. We, we covered the 300 yards with only one near accident. A sergeant who discovered on the spot how great were his powers of flight. And then we came to the line of carriers, and I knew I was in trouble. I didn't know where the brake was. <laughs> Arms flailing and feet flying, I tried every button and lever I could find. Among the things I pushed was the accelerator. <laughs> and with one last surge of power, we plowed into the row of Bren carriers parked at the curb. All seven of them bucked forward, each slamming against the other until we came to rest, hissing and smoking, our engine at last dead. <laughs> I looked at the officer. He stared straight ahead of him, his eyes large, sweat pouring down the sides of his face. He got out of the car, crossed himself, and walked away without ever once turning to look at me. <laughs> the sergeant ran up to me and pulled me out of the driver's seat. What on earth got into you, soldier? He asked me if I knew how to drive it, sergeant. He didn't ask if I knew how to stop. <laughs> It was probably fortunate for me that we were leaving the next morning for our first combat mission. We were going, rumor said, to relieve a company of commandos that had lost three out of every four of its men. And at dawn we were flown to the front. Instantly I knew I had been wrong about this adventure. It wasn't the adventure, the danger. I liked that. It was the killing. Suddenly targets were no longer pieces of paper stuck up on an earth background. They were fishers and brothers like my own, fathers and brothers like my own. Often our targets weren't even in uniform. What was I doing? How had I gotten here? I was more disgusted with myself than I had ever imagined possible. And then one day the incident occurred which has haunted me all my life. We were marching through a village that was still partially inhabited. This made us bold, for we did, did not think the communists would mine a village in which people were still living. Anti-personnel mines were the thing we feared most in the world. They kept us in a state of perpetual fear, lest these jumping, emasculating instruments would explode and leave us groveling and crippled for life. We had been in combat daily for more than three weeks, and the nerves of everyone in our unit were on edge. When about halfway through this peaceful village, 
We stepped into a nest of mines. The company went berserk. Without orders, without reasoning, we simply started shooting. We shot everything in sight. When we came to ourselves, there was not a living thing left in the village. We skirted the mined area and walked gingerly through the desolation we had created. At the end of the village, I saw the sight that was to send me nearly mad. A young Indonesian mother lay on the ground in a pool of her own blood, a baby boy at her breast. Both had been killed with the same bullet. Mm -hmm. I think I wanted to kill myself after that. I know that in the next two years, I became famous throughout the Dutch troops in Indonesia for my crazy bravado on the battlefield. I bought a bright yellow straw hat and wore it into combat with me. It was a dare and an invitation. Here I am, it said. Shoot me. Gradually, I gathered around me a group of boys who were reacting as I did, and together we invented a motto that we posted on the camp bulletin board. Get smart. Lose your mind. Everything we did those two years, whether on the battlefield or back at the rest camp, was in extremes. When we fought, we fought as madmen. When we drank, we drank until our reason left us. Together, we would weave from bar to bar, hurling our empty gin bottles through the display windows of local stores. Mm -hmm. When I woke up from these orgies, I would wonder why I was doing these things, but the question never got an answer. It occurred to me at once that perhaps the chaplain might be able to help. They told me I could find him at the officer's bar, but when I did, he was tipsy as anyone there. He stepped outside to see me, but when I told him why I'd come, he laughed and told me I'd get over it. But if you want, come to services before you fight next time, he said. That way you can kill men in a state of grace. He thought the joke was very funny. He went back inside to repeat it to the others. So I turned to my pen pals. I had kept up with all the people I had promised to write, and now I ventured to share my confusion with a few of them. In essence, they all wrote back the same thing. You're fighting for your country, Andrew, so the rest doesn't count. But one person alone said more than this, and that was Tilly. Tilly wrote to me about guilt. That part of her letter spoke to my own wretchedness, but then she went on to talk about forgiveness, and there she lost me. My sense of guilt was wrapped around me like a chain, and nothing I did, drinking, fighting, writing letters, or reading them, nothing seemed to ease its stranglehold upon me. And then one day when I was on leave in Jakarta, walking through the bazaar, I spotted a little gibbon tied to a tall pole. He was sitting on top of the pole eating some fruit, and as I went by, he jumped onto my shoulder and handed me a section of orange. I laughed, and that was all it took for the excellent Indonesian salesman to come running. Sir, the monkey likes you. I laughed again. The gibbon blinked twice very deliberately, and then showed me his teeth in what could have been a grin. How much? And that is how I came to acquire a monkey. I took him back to the <laughs> barracks with me, and at first the other boys were fascinated. Does he bite? Only crooks, I said. It was a senseless remark, meaning nothing. But no sooner had I said it than the monkey jumped out of my arms and swung along the rafters and landed of all the places in the room he could have chosen on the head of a heavy-set guy who had been winning more at poker than the average is allowed. <laughs> he crabbed sideways, flailing his arms, trying to knock the monkey off his head. The whole barracks exploded in laughter. Get him off me, Jan, Jan Zwart shouted. Get him off. I reached my, out my hand, and the monkey ran to me. Jan smoothed his hair and tucked in his shirt, but his eyes were murderous. I'll kill him, he said quietly. So on the same day, I gained one friend and lost another. I hadn't had the monkey many weeks before I noticed his stomach seemed to be hurting him. One day while carrying him, I felt what seemed to be a welt around his waist. I pulled him down on the bed and told him to lie still. Carefully, I pulled back the hair until I saw what it was. Evidently, when the gibbon had been a baby, someone had tied him with a piece of wire and never took it off. As the monkey grew, the wire became embedded in his flesh. It must have caused him terrible pain. And that evening, I began the operation. I took my razor and shaved off the monkey's hair in three-inch wide swaths around the middle. The uncovered welt was red and angry looking. While the other boys in the barracks looked on, I cut ever so gently into the tender flesh until I exposed the wire. The given lay with the most amazing patience. Even when I heard him, he looked at me with eyes that seemed to say, I understand, until at long last I was able to pull the wire away. Instantly he jumped up, did a little cartwheel, danced around on my shoulder and pulled my hair to the delight of all the boys in the barracks, except Jan. After that, my Gibbon and I were inseparable. I think I identified with him as strongly as he with me. I think I saw in the wire that had bound him a kind of parallel 
to the chain of guilt still so tight around me, and in his release, the thing I had longed for. Whenever I was not on duty in the daytime, I would take him with me on long runs into the forest. He loped along behind me until he got tired, and then with a sprint, he would dash forward, jump up, and hang onto my shorts, where he would cling until finally I picked him up and put him on my shoulder. Together we would run for 10, 15 miles until I would fling myself down on the ground to sleep. Almost always there were monkeys in the trees overhead, and my little gibbon would race into the treetops to swing and chatter with the others. The first time this happened, I thought I'd lost him. <clears throat> but the minute I stood up to start back, there was a shriek in the branches overhead, a rustling of leaves, and with a thud, the gibbon was back on my shoulder. One day, when laughing and tired, I bore him back to the camp, I found a letter waiting for me from my brother Ben. He went on and on about a funeral. It was only slowly I realized it was Mama's. Mm -hmm. Apparently a telegram had been sent, but it had never come. I knew that I was going to cry. I gave the monkey some water, and while he was drinking, slipped away from camp. I didn't want even the gibbon with me. I ran and ran until my side throbbed in pain, knowing suddenly how very alone I must be, always be without her. And it was that week that Jan Zwart took revenge on the monkey. One evening I came in from guard duty to be met with the news. Andy, the little monkey's dead. Dead, I said dully. What happened? One of the boys picked him up by his tail and kept slamming him against the wall. Was it Zwart? The guy wouldn't answer. Where's the monkey now? He's outside in the bushes. I found him draped over a branch. The worst of it, he wasn't quite dead. I picked him up and brought him back to the barracks. His jaw was broken. A great hole gaped in his throat. When I tried to give him water, it ran out the hole. Jan Zwart watched me warily, prepared for a fight. But I didn't fight. Too many blows in a row had left me stupefied. Over the next ten days, I nursed that monkey day and night. I sewed its throat closed and fed it sugar water. I rubbed its little muscles. I stroked its fur. I kept it warm and talked to it constantly. It was a creature I had released from bondage, and I wasn't going to let it go without a struggle. Slowly, very slowly, the gibbon began to eat and then crawl about on the bed, and at last to sit up and chatter at me crossly if I was slow with the hourly feedings. And at the end of two months, he was running with me again in the forest, but he never recovered his confidence in people. The barracks was a place of terror for him, and the only time he would stop trembling when people were close was when all four legs and his tail were wrapped around my arm and his head was hidden in my shirt front. Mm -hmm. When news came of a major new drive against the enemy, I asked if someone who could drive would borrow a jeep and take me and my gibbon into the jungle. I want to let him go and drive away. Fast, I said. Will anyone take me? I'll go. I turned around and it was Jan Zwarton. I held his eye for a long time, but he didn't blink. All right. And as we drove to the jungle, I explained to the monkey why I could no longer keep him. At last we stopped. As I put the little gibbon on the ground, his wise little eyes stared into mine with what looked like comprehension. He didn't try to jump back into the jeep. As we pulled away, he sat on the ground there, staring after us until we were out of sight. A good place to stop. The next morning, February 12, 1949, our unit moved out at dawn, and it was a good thing I let the monkey go when I did, for I never got back to camp. Okay. <coughs> we'll drop it off there for right now. It gives me time. It tells me how many more minutes till the end of the chapter. How many? Three minutes. Oh, that's finished. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen this before. This is the first one. Is, yeah, we, one we just didn't want to be too long. That's good. Okay. I tried to pretend the same bravado on this mission I had felt on earlier ones. I wore my yellow straw hat as I had before, and I shouted as loud. I cursed as long. I moved forward with my company day after day. But even my defiance seemed to have deserted me. And then one morning a bullet smashed through my ankle and I was out of the war. It happened so suddenly, and at first so painlessly, that I didn't know what had happened. We had walked into an ambush. The enemy was on three sides of us, and many times our strength. Why I was shot in the ankle and not in my straw hat, I don't know. But as I was running, I suddenly fell. I knew I had not stumbled, but I could not get up. And then I saw that my right combat boot had two holes in it, and blood was coming out both of them. I'm hit, I called, not excited. It was simply a fact, and I stated it as such. A buddy rolled me into a ditch out of sight, and at last medics came with a stretcher, and they put me on it and began moving me out, crouching low in the ditch. Still had my straw hat and refused to take it off, even when it drew fire. A bullet once went through the crown. 
I just didn't care. Hours later, still wearing my yellow straw hat, I was stretched out on an operating table in the evacuation hospital. It took two and a half hours to sew up the foot. I heard the doctors discussing whether or not to amputate. Their nurse asked me to take the hat off, but I refused. Don't you know what that is, the doctor asked the nurse. That's the unit symbol. These are the boys who got smart and lost their minds. But I hadn't, and that was the final irony, the final failure. I hadn't even managed to get my brains blown out, just a foot. Somehow in all my furious self-destructiveness, I had never considered this possibility. I had always seen myself going out in a blaze of contempt for the whole human farce. But to live and cripple was the meanest fate of all. My great adventure had failed. Worse yet, I was 20 years old and had discovered that there was no real adventure anywhere in the world. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> you guys will probably remember some, <laughs> some of those highlights. <laughs> this is a very unique story. Yeah. I remember all them crouch over. <laughs> That's what we call them, crouch. Yeah, crouch. <laughs> Yeah, war is never a pretty thing, but uh, mm -hmm. of course, uh, a lot more ugly than it is pretty, uh, even indifference. <laughs> but uh, of course, this is a uh, this is the weekend when we uh, honor those that have served in our military. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so kind of interesting that we we uh, hit on the chapter that <clears throat> talks about the deals war. with uh, somebody going through that kind of thing. <clears throat> Okay, um, now let me ask this, who remembers what we were talking about last week? <laughs> Give you another little trial. We're talking about the basics within Christianity, aren't we? I mean, um, one of those uh, 316s, and you know, people are always talking about John 316, but another 316 is 1 Timothy 316, and that says, for all scripture is inspired by God, and... Profitable, mm -hmm. right? For and doctrine, reproof. for doctrine, right? For reproof, what does reproof mean? Correction. Okay. Well, <clears throat> it says for reproof, for correction. Okay. So there's a uh, there's two yeah, words. Reproof is when you tell somebody what they're doing wrong. Correction mm -hmm. is when you make tell the adjustment. Make the so adjustment. One is you can make the adjustment yourself, and one <laughs> is you can be told by somebody. Right. So a little different emphasis there. Instruction in righteousness is the uh, the other thing that's mentioned there, and that's really what we've been talking about. And you know, these are four categories that are very foundational uh, in our Bibles, <clears throat> and and certainly, uh, I think things that we need to be reminded of. Uh, we need to be reminded, um, you know, Paul in another reference says that we, uh, another scripture we looked at too, is that we are to examine ourselves. And he says to examine yourself, whether, whether you even be in the faith. That's an interesting expression, because you would think if somebody is studying their Bible, and they're going to church, and they're making contributions, tithing or whatever, and they're doing things, you would think, isn't it obvious that they're in the faith? But it could be that they're just going through the routine. How often, you know, when we, look back, when we look back at the Jewish nation, we saw them get into a routine of doing things a certain way, and all of a sudden the routine became the priority, and the meaning got lost in the actions, you see, and the, and the monotony of going through this thing day in and day. They got day. caught up in the letter of the law, not the <clears throat> spirit. Well, you know, they had leaders that. Got them into a lot of that. True. That uh, True. decided it would be good to do it this way, you know. Right, but also on the other side of that, Ken, is people that allowed the leaders to do to that. To do that. Okay. It's one thing to have somebody moving in a certain direction, it's another thing to have a whole bunch of other people allowing them to do it and get away with it, right? <laughs> you can go to church, you know, see how many of them carry it. Bible yeah, excellent point. I mean, uh, uh, worse yet, to see the ministers who get up and preach without one, and that's that's become a routine, also mm. become very much a routine. Yeah. All right. Well, last week we looked at, uh, for example, Ephesians two five, which was talking about the results of conversion, 
and talking about how the Spirit quickens us. <clears throat> what does it mean to be quickened? You made my pencil. Is that your pencil? Is it your pencil with the one with the little thingy on it? <laughs> yeah, what does it mean you're going to one with a racer on it. Yeah, what did you say, Elijah? It says to be made faster. Uh, to be well, to be quickened, to be ma actually to be made alive. Actually, to be made alive, yeah. <clears throat> to be made alive, to be uh, energized with uh, life. Observe. The Bible refers to the quick and the dead, so obviously, yeah. <laughs> the observe. opposite of being dead. <laughs> okay. Now, the other scripture that I want to repeat, First John three fourteen. We want to see what the evidence of that is that's taking place. First, uh, First John three. <clears throat> First John chapter three and uh, verse fourteen. Someone like to read this one? We know that we have passed in our, from death to life, because we love the brethren. Okay. He who does not, he who does not love his brother abides in death. Okay, so what's the key component in this text? Love, love, love. For your brothers. Okay, love. Um, <clears throat> I don't think we as uh, as Christians really understand the depth of that. Now, we, we talked last week about the different types of love, remember? We talked about Eris kind of love and phileo type of love and, of course, agape type of love. And agape is the one that uh, obviously is the most important, the one that needs to be uh, you know rightly understood more than anything else. That's a godly love, right? An unselfish love type of love. And of course, that immediately took us to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And that's where we ended up. We didn't finish that up. But let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. <clears throat> and you've often heard that called the love chapter, right? Even though in the King James they use the word charity. I'm just going to pick it up in, in verse 8. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And uh, we'll start there with verse 8. Everybody there? <clears throat> okay. It says there, love. And of course, again, your Bible may say charity, but the word is agape. This is agape that we're talking about. Agape never fails. Love never fails. Okay. Now, what's interesting here is that uh, Paul goes on to say prophecies, they will what? They, shut they will fail. I'm not reading from the new, in the New King James, it says they will fail. I'm not sure what the King James says there. It says, uh, fail. It says they, shall fail. they shall fail. They shall fail? Okay. Okay, so love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Okay. What's he trying to say here? I mean, he's not trying to say that, that we can't rely on prophecy in the Bible, right? I mean, can we, I mean prophetic... No. Prophecy in the Bible, I mean, that doesn't fail, does it? Uh, no, I don't think that's what he's talking about. He's just talking about people <laughs> prophesying on their own what they think. Okay, so in other words, there are all kinds of prophecies that are out there. There were prophecies that were... The false prophets. All kinds of prophecies mm -hmm. that were... There were and in fact, even several messiahs, people that were claiming to be the messiah back here in the time of Christ. Barabbas, for example, claimed to be a messiah. Or the Messiah, okay. So you got you got uh, this kind of thing. Now the actual word, also you'll find in other translation, the word fails not used, but the word end. In other words, uh, there are prophecies and they will end. In other words, even if even prophecies in the Bible, uh, things that are predicted in the Bible, they they come true, and then they end, right? So that's really more what what it's saying here that the prophecies are going to come, but they're going to they're going to end. Uh, people, there's always going to be uh, uh, tongues and people talking different languages, but ultimately they're going to end. Right? Uh, it says knowledge, for example, and here, here you see it more clearly. Uh, where there's knowledge, 
uh, knowledge is going to end or fade away. Um, I'll give you an example of that. You know, we've been talking about, for example, or even over the last year, we've been talking a lot about the papacy and how involved they are, um, you know, from early, from, from even the first century here, how involved they were in, in taking the church, uh, the descendants of the actual apostles, taking the church in a direction that's contrary. And, of course, that was predicted, right? We've been talking all about that kind of stuff. Uh, who can tell me who the tenth pope was? Anybody here tell me who the 10th pope was? You know, they claim Peter was the first pope, right? Everybody probably would have gotten that. That's knowledge that hasn't yet faded away. Who? Peter. Peter? A lot of people claim that, he, claim that Peter was the first yeah, pope. Yeah, a lot of Catholics they claim that Peter was the first pope. You probably would have guessed that, right? That's, that's knowledge that hasn't quite faded away. But who was the 10th pope? Who cares? <laughs> well, see, that's knowledge that's faded away, right? It's, it's come to an end. It's Pius the first, by the way, if anybody is interested. But, but at any rate, um, we faded away. Verse 9 says, uh, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away or will come to an end. Okay, so he's saying the same thing in, in a little bit different way. Um, we know a lot of stuff, but we don't know all the stuff. Right? We don't know everything. There's nobody that knows everything. But there will come a day, there will come a day when the one who knows everything will end up showing up. Right? And then of course it's only going to be important that we know him, not all the knowledge and the you know, the interpretation of prophecy and all this kind of thing. It's going to be important just to know him. When prophecy had to come to an end, or it wouldn't be prophecy. Right. It would have to be fulfilled, wouldn't it? And when it's fulfilled, it would be coming to an end. It has to. Yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the better translation. This gives you the impression in the, King, in the King James and the New King James, it almost is giving you the impression that prophecy fails. And what, what would it mean for prophecy to fail? That it didn't correct. That they would be incorrect. The interpretation would be incorrect, you see. Well, I think you, in time, the part we forget will be given back to us, you know, that you once knew it and you don't ever think of it anymore, I think it'll come back, you be, uh, it'll be given back to you. Right. <clears throat> you know, Ken, I've heard you make this statement before. Man, I wish I could remember everything that I have been taught, Yeah. you know, over my lifetime. Uh, that time will come when perfection comes, when, when, the, when, we're, when we have new bodies capable of retaining. I mean, our minds are absolutely incredible, even in the condition that we're in today. They're absolutely stunning in terms of what they can do and accomplish. But there'll come a day when our minds will be made new. You know? We'll have new bodies, new minds capable of learning for eternity. We won't forget, you know. We won't, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think to some extent, it's also talking about, you know, <laughs> as you go through your life. Now, how many of us remember the classes we took in grade school? I do. Re recess. <laughs> Love the recess. Yeah. But I mean, do you re do you remember your second grade <clears throat> social studies class? Yes, you knew it very well at the time. You probably knew a lot of the information you studied at the time. Christopher Columbus. But over started. time, you know, your life has changed, life has moved on, and you've forgotten most of that that happened back then. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of the, the description that says that you know, when we, we get to the place where we get to heaven, I've you know, read that when we get back. there, we will try to recall the trials that we experienced back here in this life. But we won't even be able to call them to mind. We won't even be able to. I mean, we're going to be so in the, in the present. We're not going to care about all that stuff that happened in the past anymore. Well, that mind's going to make uh, Apple computers obsolete. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right. We won't be we won't be forgetters anymore, will we? <laughs> and of course, Rose is uh, maybe she's just been reading ahead, but there as you read the next couple next couple of verses. You begin to understand this is this is actually establishing the point that she's making there. Um, verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a, an adult, I put away childish things. 
And like like uh, Mama is saying, there, you know, we're just so far removed from those things that happen. And we've grown up, and we've matured, and, and of course, you, you gain a whole different perspective of things. You know, even even uh, Simeon at 16, he has a, a certain perspective of life. But when he's 32, when he's twice that, that old, you know, he'll have a different perspective of life. Right? And so as you get older, you just develop that different perspective. For now we see in a mirror, it says in verse 12 here, dimly. Um, what is it that we're looking at in the mirror? What do you see when you look in the mirror? Ourselves. You see ourselves. Right? Hopefully yourself. Okay, yeah, this, yeah, hopefully the King James says, see well, see now we see through a glass darkly. Through a glass. Okay. What's so it would be look? like looking through a, a smoky glass or a, a smoky window. Yeah, you can see how dirty your face is whenever yeah. you look in there. The next part says, but then face to face. So yeah. is that implying that it is a mirror? Or is it, yeah. No, it's saying, as we see now, as we see now, we're seeing like, Brother said through a foggy glass, but then there's going to come a time when we will actually see face to face, which means we'll actually see Christ Jesus face to face, because this is what it's talking about, is how we're going to actually see Jesus. We don't seem plain and clear right now, but there's coming a time when we will actually see him just as if we were sitting across from him, seeing him face to face. Okay, and what allows, what will allow us to experience that? This is what the whole chapter is about. What will allow us to experience that? Love. Agape. Boy, yeah. love and charity, that's the, the biggest things here. Yeah. Self-sacrificial love. Is that what we see when we look in the mirror? Do we see a, a person that's demonstrating self-sacrificial love in the world today? Well, I think this is what I, this way I see it. We see, when we look through that foggy mirror, we can see some of the things that Christ has done, mm -hmm. but we don't understand it. And we can see some things that He may have done, and we still don't really understand it. But there's going to come a day that when we actually see clearly and see all the things He actually did, right. you know, just think, just think how many things, how many times has he intervened in our lives that permits us to be sitting here today? Sure. Why am I sitting here today? It was simply only because of his intervention. I'm not here on my own. I'm here for a reason. That's right. Every day, in fact, every day is a gift. Yeah. Right? And of course, what do you do with that gift? What, what, what do we do with that gift that we're given every day? Do, do we even ask ourselves that kind of question when we wake up in the morning? You know, or do we just take life for granted, like most people? Well, I tell you what was talking about seeing what I Now, I think this is just my little riff draft way of thinking. I think that he probably sees it that way more or less. Okay, but the older you get, when you get my and Kenny's age, believe me, we see a whole lot different than we would if we were sixteen. Different perspective. Different perspective. I well, can see enough, and I wish I'd have done everything different. Grew on that. And I think, too, that we see him differently at various points in our experience because we haven't gotten to know him at that level. And so, what our understanding of him was when we were teenagers <coughs> is vastly different from what we understand him as now. And we've had you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of experience beyond that where we've gotten to know him better. You know, we may have we may have been reasonably sure we were hearing his voice directing us early on, but now we get to the place where we recognize the sound. I mean, it's 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 that walking with him that causes you to. Know. Sometimes you can pick up the phone and somebody's on the other end, and you don't know who that is, and then you hear them speak and you hear a certain tone of voice and you know immediately mm -hmm. who that is. And I think that has to do with life experience. When we get to know him that way, we will know his voice. And then we will know when he's wanting us to do something, we know it's from him. It's like when Abraham was told to take his son Isaac and offer him. Know, it must have really known the voice of God to be like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> but even, even so, even so, no matter how close you may be to Christ today, 
It makes no difference. I don't care how close you are today. Whenever you're actually face to face with him, you look back on that and say, "Man, I didn't know nothing. Yeah. I thought I knew." <clears throat> Just like studying today, the more I study today, the dumber I know I am. <laughs> It's just like, it's just like, you know, you think you know, but you don't. One song that I like says, the more we learn, the more we know, we don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's really what it is. It's, you know, to me, looking at the prospect of eternity, there are so many things that I would like to learn about. So many things I would like to And every once in a while, I'll, I'll see one of these, you know, these nature videos where they're talking about some intricate part of life, some some creature that does something really unique or a flower that grows really unusually or smells really odd or whatever. And I think I would love to have the time to get into some of these things and stuff. But we don't have time. Mm -hmm. And to me, the, the biggest joy of looking at a prospect of eternity is to have the chance to do and study and experience all of these things that we can only skim the surface on now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I'm waiting on, is this... Uh, uh, when you're changed, you'll be changed incorruptible. Right. And that's the good part I like, that I won't be corruptible. Won't be tired anymore. <laughs> <laughs> won't get sick anymore. When I worked down at uh, Optical Cable, one of the things, uh, of course, after having been there for a number of years, uh, I would often train people to run certain extrusion lines and so forth. And so one of the things that I would do after maybe a couple of weeks of, of training and having somebody showing them different things and whatnot, I would, I would basically ask them one question. You know, I'd give them a little test. And, but the main reason for the test was not to find out what they knew. The main reason for the test was to find out what they didn't know. And I would tell them, I don't need to know what you know. I need to... I need to understand what you don't know. That's important, you see. And I think God does the same thing with us. He, he, he wants to take us a certain place. He has a certain expectation, particularly for those who are going to live through uh, to the time of trouble and the plagues and so forth. Uh, God, needs to, God needs to impress us with what we don't know to prepare us for that moment. With, with just like the apostles... If he let us see all these things, it'd be so overwhelming to us. We'd just be, uh, we'd just lose our minds. You wouldn't right. be able to function. Well, you can imagine if, if Paul had been given a vision back in his day that told him it was going to be another 2,000 years and all of these terrible things were going to happen in the world, that would be the most discouraging thing in oh, the yeah. world. Oh, yeah. You know, so he lets us, so lets what did Paul, generation So what was Paul's attitude? Imminent. What was Paul's attitude as he was running around ministering? That, that Christ is coming. And he now. was coming now. Soon. soon. He was coming soon. The, you know, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. And we can make yeah. and we can actually make the same statement yeah. because he is going to come in two ways. One, as we as we close our eyes in death, or two, as he comes and we're taken in rapture. Sure. So he could come any day for any of us. Sure. Sure. I mean, as far as we go, uh, consciously. Everybody had the same thought of the end. They had theirs. They had to be ready, and we got to have ours, and we got to be ready. Mm -hmm. He gave everybody the same thing. He didn't tell Paul, you know, I, I ain't going to be there for another 4,000 years, so. Relax. He so he'd be so he, he, He'd give up. Yeah. And one of them shipwrecks, he'd just say, I ain't going to swim nowhere. I'm just saying, so, you know, I... Yeah. When, I when I read uh, statements like this here, now I know in part. Um, you know, for the last year, we've been talking a lot about the sacrifice that the Son of God had to make. And <coughs> at least I'm, I'm hoping and praying that, that we've made an impression on at least our little group here that... that uh, Christ ended up doing a lot more than traditionally we think. You know, when I read a, a, a scripture like this, now, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as as I also am known. In other words, I think God has blessed us with insight that, that goes beyond what people traditionally think was the price being paid for sin. But 
that's not the end of it. He's still going to show us more and more and Absolutely. more. Exactly. As time yes. gets closer, yeah. the more we're going to see. Right, exactly. And, of course, I think it's necessary, isn't it? It's, it's necessary, necessary that we gain that added insight to carry us through because we have to under, we have to develop a greater appreciation for what he has done. We will not be able to make it through if we don't. Right. So you know, look at the illustration of, of a diamond or a gem. Mm -hmm. You know, they cut facets into those diamonds. Every facet bends the light differently. Right. Every one you every facet you look at, the light is a little different. It's still light, but it's gonna look a little different. Scripture's like that. You can you can read this read this verse one time and then come back and look at it a year later and suddenly see something in it that you had never seen before, and we'll be able to do that for all eternity. There will always be a new angle, a new way to turn it that you will see the light a little differently and appreciate how beautiful it is. <coughs> you know, there's not going to be an end to that being able to to discover new things about Him and what He's done for us. But how many times we read that and I say, Dang, don't why didn't I see that before? <laughs> I mean, it's clear and plain. I can remember, the, you know, just um, John 14, you know, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again. And I had never thought about that text in light of what happens at death. You know, if we, if we died and went right to be with him, he'd have no need to come back. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean, you know, it, that one verse in light of that verse, and I had, I had read that verse all my life. I had repeated it to people, I had shared it with people, and I had never Made seen it in that connection. You just didn't anymore. understand it. You knew it, but you didn't understand <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, but I had never looked at it from that angle. That was a different facet <laughs> to that diamond, you know, that I had never seen before. And there's a lot of these verses that, you know, suddenly a thought will just jump out at you that never crossed your mind in all the times you've read it. Yeah, our minds are like word processors, and the more information that we put into it, as we read through Scripture, the more connections we can make and we can see. And we'll see, like for example, Christ, you know, in Matthew 24, he, he talking to the disciples because he doesn't want to overwhelm them with the reality of what's going to happen to their city in 70 AD, he mingles that understanding with actually the end of the world. And so you see these, these, uh, this mingling, Layers. these layers of, of understanding and truth. And it's for us to read through and allow the Holy Spirit to uh, inspire us to gain that, that greater insight. You know, what did is Christ, you know, he, he looks at us and it pleases him to know that we study, okay? And whenever... Whenever we see something that we never saw before, you know, and say, why didn't I see that? You know, he'll say, he'll say, watch this, I'm going to show him something else. Watch him go off the deep end. Uh, watch him go off the deep end. Watch yeah. him go ballistic. Yeah, you know. But but you see, he enjoys it, yeah? yeah. And, and he knows. He enjoys, I always said, he's, he loves being the God of surprises. Yeah, and, it's, and, and the more, and, and I tell you what, he will always, he was always, more you study, he'll always give you more. Yeah. He'll always open it up to you. Okay. And of course the last verse here, now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is of course love, is agape. Okay. Faith is always going to be around, it's most necessary. Hope, of course, is most necessary. Uh, love is most necessary, but that's that's the greater priority. But anywhere in there in scripture you find for the word love, you can always put Christ there. And it's gonna it's going to always highlight him. Now what's interesting is if you read the next verse, because uh, you know, chapters of course this takes us into what we see as the next chapter. But in the original you didn't have these divisions. No. Okay. So look at look at you look at uh, fourteen in the first verse there. And remember, remember what he said down here, the greatest of these is love. And then in the King James it reads, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may Prosper. prophesy. Pro Pro you know? Prosper. Isn't it? Prophesy. Prophecy, but yeah. you may prophesy. 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 Do you know, this is where our, our modern language and our modern understanding has been tainted with a lot of things. Because when we think of the word prophesy or prophecy, we think only in terms of 
a dream or a vision that predicts the future. If you ask somebody what prophecy means, they will say it's something that predicts the future. And yet it actually doesn't mean that at all. No. It actually means somebody who speaks for the Lord, who has discernment. What is know. discernment? Good question. What do you think it is, Larry? <laughs> an understanding. Could be an understanding. What do you think well, discernment yes. is, Kenny? You looking for a sharpener or something? Yeah. Here, just get you use another pencil. Here's one. Oh, sharpener. you're boring, my mom. <laughs> There's a pencil sharpener up on the buffet there somewhere. Of course, if you can't find one, he'll start you know, gnawing on it. Not wait you and all that thing. No, but prophet, but discernment. If there's ever a time where we need discernment, it's this generation. Discernment means the ability to tell what's truth. What the truth is. Yeah. yeah. And you only get that discernment by getting to know him and knowing what his desires of his heart are. And knowing his word well enough to understand what his character is and how he operates. You know, discernment is that ability to hear something and think, well, that doesn't sound quite right to me. Or, no, that sounds right on target. You know, you begin to be able to weigh things. It's the ability to tell, you know, does this make sense or does from it not make sense? Error. You know, discern from truth you know, error. Revelation, it talks about the church of Laodicea. <laughs> And it says, you, you know, you, you're blind. You're poor and blind and wretched and naked. You don't even know that you're naked. You don't know any of these things. And the first counsel is to buy ISAV. Well, what does the ISAV do? So you can see. He wants us to see. He wants us to discern what truth is. And he wants, that means we also have to discern when error is present. How are you going to know when error is present? Only when you know the truth. That's right. exactly you right. can't know if it's there unless you first know the truth. That's so why the treasury agents find out what counterfeit is? They studied the truth so the truth. much they know exactly what the truth looks like. They it know differs. it's so so detailed that all it takes is a slight difference. That was exactly my next thought was that very. Well, you know, my kids used to do different things, and they would usually end up getting caught. And they'd say, "How did you know I was up to something?" Little old me. I see him back there rolling their eyes and stuff. Who are we talking about here? And you know, it was never a case of looking for something that they were doing wrong. It was a case of I'd pick up on a tone of voice, a certain expression on their face, a certain way that they moved, or a certain lack of sound. I mean, they say silence is golden, but not when you've got a house full of kids. It's not. And... I would just know something was out of the ordinary, and that would get my radar up, and I'd start looking. But it wasn't because I was trying to find something wrong with them. It was because I knew them well enough to know, for most cases, the sound of their foot on the steps, yeah, to know the sound of their voice. But even when they whispered, I could tell. And so if I heard something that was out of character for what they were, that would set my radar going. Uh, that didn't happen too often with my kids, though, did it? No. no. <laughs> All right. So why is Paul, um, you know, basically saying, you know, the agape, that's the greatest gift and whatnot? But then he's he just goes right on to continue and says, pursue that. However, desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And it says, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him, however, in the spirit he speaks in mysteries, etc. Why, why does he go on to talk about these other things when he's just told everybody um, love is the greatest, basically the greatest gift? Well, just because it's the greatest gift, well, if it says it's the greatest gift, there has to be other gifts. There has to be other gifts or it couldn't be the greatest. Okay, that's true. All right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, why does, why does he... he, he express it in this fashion, you think? Well, I've heard a lot of people justify the charismatic gift of tongues with this one verse alone. I was going to say, that's almost, what, that's almost what it sounds like if you're reading it from that perspective. Which is an area that I think we need to dig into so we know what truth is in that, that area. How do we know what the true gift of the Spirit is versus a false gift? You can't know unless you study have uh, how many of you have ever run into somebody and they'll say uh, uh, they'll say you know God only gave us two commandments and 
and they'll say, those two commandments are to love God and love our fellow man. And that's all. All those two would hang all of us. No, no, no. Don't go any further than that. That's all we need, right? And uh, as long as you love, you're okay. That's right? what I call the kumbaya gospel. Kumbaya. <laughs> so, so what's Paul trying to say here? By, by he's because again he's continuing. He says here, you know, pursue love. That's good. We we want to, That's the greatest thing. Pursue that. However, there are these other things that we don't want to. Yes. Ignore, yeah. neglect. Okay, <laughs> that are also very, very important, right? Well, in a sort. I mean, just like you know, the example of on those two commandments. You know, those kind of, if done correctly, should lay the foundation for the others. For many other things. Mm -hmm. many other if you love God, you'll do the other three. And remember, and well, realistically, the <laughs> commandments of God are actually principles, and if the true principles are to love God, Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself, those two principles, if you rightly apply them, will apply, be able to, you'll be able to figure out what needs to be done. Right. You know, you, it, it's natural. And so, you know, the Jews came along and said, oh, well, we, we, don't, we don't need principles, we need rules. Let me clarify this for you. And all of these little rules and things came out of that. But the reality is that the principle is is perfectly fine. If we live by principle and not by rules, you know, we could, we could make decisions about almost anything. If we know him and we know what's within his character and what his, his, his desire is for all of us, we would respond accordingly. We would respond to each other the way he would want us to respond. You're supposed to be the sheep that knows, know his voice. Yes. Okay. But you see so many times we sit back and we let, just like the Jews did, let the priest and the teachers and everything tell us what we should be believing. Don't study the Bible because you won't understand it. I'll tell you what it actually says. Well, that's why not only, yeah, not only with the Jews, but we find that same concept playing out in almost every church denomination. Because it's it's whatever the pastor says, it's whatever the priest says, it's it's you know the, and accept it blindly. The attitude is like you know they're the doctor; they're going to tell you what medicine to take and, and how often to take and that kind of thing. So we listen to them. But what does Scripture say? Second Timothy two fifteen. Study to show. No word does it say. No word does it say read. It says study to study show thyself approved. No word does it say listen God. to the sermons to see what yeah. what to do. In fact, what did what did the <coughs> Thessalonians? What did the people do that gladly oh, yeah. heard the Bereans, gladly heard the word? What did they do? Search the scriptures daily. Yeah, but what did what did they also do when they heard somebody present something? They they checked. Yeah, well, they search the scriptures to see daily to see so. if so. these things were so. Okay, so that's, that's right. That's the guy. Let me let me uh, let me get a little more detailed in this. Uh, idea we're talking about uh, because again the, the scriptures are setting forth principles but I want I want you to get a I want us to get a good idea of what those things really mean and I'm looking at this little devotional here reflecting Christ which is a great little devotional it came out you know eons ago but um, in October 18 and 19 it applies uh, specifically talking about 1 Corinthians 13. So I wanted to share a couple of things here with you. Uh, we've got about some time left to do that. Uh, after quoting, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It's not arrogant or rude. Um, here's some of the commentary. It says, the truth of God is designed to elevate the receiver. You know, Larry mentioned, um, and of course Rose has been talking about discernment. If there's discernment, that means you have truth and you have error. Okay? <laughs> And discernment means understanding the difference between the two of those. Okay? Now, there are a lot of people around in Christianity that believe certain things that are true, but they may not have the truth. What's the difference between the two? What's the difference between that statement? There are people that believe things that are true, but they don't necessarily have the truth. Well, what does that mean? Well, they're just misled. They think they know what truth is. And well, well, now wait a minute. I'm saying that they 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 believe certain things that are true, but they may not have the truth. Like for example, you could go to maybe any Christian, oh, well, any Christian, and ask them, uh, "Is uh, is Jesus part of the Godhead?" 
What are most Christians going to say? Say yeah. They're going to say yes. That's true. That's a true statement, right? But but uh, they may not have the truth. What, what, what's the difference? What makes what makes well, something the question. what makes something true? What's the difference between tr something that's true and having the truth? What's the difference? Knowing why it's true. If I hear you right, what you're saying is what is the difference between the truth and something you believe to be. All right, the let me truth. say it this way: Christians believe that Jesus is the Son of God, part of the Godhead, right? Okay. But uh, he's going to sneak in here secretly and take us back to heaven. And then there's going to be seven years of tribulation, and then he's going to come okay. in person. Jesus is that is the truth? Is that the truth? No, no that's so not the truth. truth. Okay, it's not the truth. truth. <laughs> okay, so you can believe certain elements that are true, but not have the truth. Well, you can have truth some truth, but not the whole. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're talking about knowing it as truth. part. Right. Yeah. Like the truth the I mean, the whole I'll give you an example about, Probably, you know, about that. Okay. There was an advertisement on TV, you know, that uh, for a, a, a old folks' home or something. Anyway, the nurse is uh, tending to the lady, and she says that when somebody dies, raise the window. Somebody's got to open the window so the soul can depart. Yeah, right. right. She's getting a, a spirit and the, your soul all mixed up. Sure. Yeah. How's your soul going to get up when you're laying there in bed and leave? Sure. And which a lot of people think they've got a spirit. They ain't got a spirit. They got a breath of life. Now let me ask you this: being that being the case. And this individual should pass away. Will they make it or not? Of course they'll make it. They don't know. Because they're, believe, because they're living up to all the truth they know. And that's a decision that really God ultimately has sure. to make. There's no way we can judge uh, no. those kind of things. No. But at any rate. You know, there's, a lot, there's a lot of things in our lives where we understand in part. In part. And, we, and as long as we understand it. For example, we talk about the sun going down. Is the sun going down? No. It's no. Just it's just going you know, my friends who are who are into <laughs> astronomy and all of that would give a very lengthy explanation about how we are looking at the earth through the curvature of the earth, and it just because the earth is turning and we're moving away from the sun, it looks like the sun is going down. And they can, they understand so much more. But <clears throat> yeah, we, yeah, yeah, when I say down. is the sun going, down, we all understand that. Going down where you're at. It is, and so. <laughs> We, our, our understanding is in part, it may not be as great as this person who has studied this over here, but we understand what we understand and we believe that to be true. But what we have to understand is we will be judged on what we know or could have known. See, that's what's going, that's what's going to make the difference. Are we being judged on what we know or who we know? No, 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 no. <laughs> well, we've got to be grand we'll on that. We'll all be knowing. But, but would you see... The only, the only ultimately it would be both, right? Yeah, but the only see here, <laughs> we can't say, "I'm Seventh Day Adventist, we're going to make it." You can't say that, even even if it should be true. That's what the Jews thought. Too. Sure, see, that's just what I'm saying. We that's Abraham exactly for our father. what We've they made it thought. You the, can't the, do that. The chosen generation. We're all on a different plane of learning. You know, just think about when Jesus said. He went out to the eleventh hour, and he brought in this this person, mm -hmm. and he got the same wages as the one that worked all day. Okay. Now this one tell you now. Now there's going to come a day when right before Christ comes, that the last individual on earth will be saved, and he may not be saved for more than just a second or two, but he's going to get the same reward as you and I get. Yeah, praise the Lord. See, so what we have to do is we can't judge anybody because they don't know what we think we know. I think part of the problem is, is that we've come to think of that parable with the reward as being something that has been earned. And it yeah. actually isn't. When we go to work for the Lord and we, we, we have chosen to work for Him and we trust Him, we are entitled <coughs> to that reward that He's promised, whether we've worked our whole lives for Him or whether we've worked just a short time. Mm -hmm. 
the, that reward has nothing to do with our work. Our it has to do with His grace, grace being and, being given and to the us. Charity and the charity. Whenever, whenever the, the the man started paying, he paid from the flash to the first. Right. And he says, "Hey, you get mad at me, soon because I want to be joyful and cheerful. That I want to show charity, you know, love." Okay, listen to this whole statement here. It says, "The truth of God is designed to elevate the receiver, to refine his taste, and to sanctify his judgment." Right. What so, does it mean, sanctify his judgment? I think that's really talking about discernment. To make holy. To have a, a holy, holy. To have a holy judgment or holy discernment. Um, so if if we if we look at somebody that's promoting something that's obviously error, and there, there are probably some fine lines that we could debate and talk about for or against, but when there's something that's like for example spiritual formation, okay? Take, taking the uh, spiritual disciplines of Ignatius Loyola, you know, the, the, the uh, one who got the Jesuits started, taking that perspective and trying to throw it out and saying, this is the direction we want to go, right? And you all come along. In, in this okay, that's an obvious deception. That's an obvious error, okay? In thinking, in, in doctrine, in every which way, that's uh, that's right from the pits of hell. Okay, so when when you have a group of people that are going in that direction, in an obvious direction that's error, then that means this their their judgment isn't sanctified. Their taste isn't going to be refined. They're not going to be elevated, are they? That's what I'm saying, because that because that's not part of the truth. They just go on with the crowd. They're going with the crown, okay? And no matter how <clears throat> sincerely they're doing it and how yeah, earnestly, can be, they can be sincerely wrong and going in the wrong direction and learning the wrong things that they will then have to unlearn. You know, Moses, when, when God called him out of Egypt, Moses was taken out to the wilderness for 40 years so that he could unlearn uh -huh. what he had learned in the, in the courts of Egypt. Yeah, he needed to unlearn education. all of that education that he got there so that God could use it. He had to, had to clean all that junk He had out. to learn the truth. And it's a whole lot easier to learn something than it is to relearn or unlearn. Okay, yeah. the, the character of the Christian to be holy, his manners comely, right? his words without guile. What, is it, what does it mean, comely? That might be a word you're not quite familiar with. What does comely Humble. mean? Pleasant. Okay. Actually, so, it's attractive. Attractive, uh, pleasant, pleasant yeah. okay. His words without guile. What, is, what does that mean? Uh, no bad words. Okay, no bad Actually, words. Actually, guile, guile has to do with honesty. Sly, yes. Yeah, sly, cunning, crafty. Honesty like and that. integrity. You know, integrity. When, when Jesus said, you know, behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. He meant somebody who had absolute integrity and trust in God. You know, he was... He was looking for somebody who really it wasn't who wasn't dishonest. What's the uh, antithesis? What's the opposite of uh, integrity? Dishonesty. <laughs> no, you're not telling the truth if you don't have the integrity. Not living up to your word. Yeah. Right. The Honesty. Honor, right. Okay. There should be a, a continual effort to imitate the society. A person hopes to soon join that of the angels who have never fallen by sin. So we know that when Christ comes, he's coming with all his heavenly host. The angels have never sinned. The, the, the righteous angels have never sinned. And so that's who we're going to be in company with. And so a lot of people have the impression that, well, when Jesus comes, he'll change my whole character. Is that, is that true? Should be changing your character right now. Yeah. You'll it has change to your be character. happening now. It has to be ha the molding no. and the making, and, the, and the, it has to be taking place now. I guess that's the dangerous <laughs> rationale that people have for uh, for their character defects now. Is they'll just say, "Well, the Lord will sort it out when I get there." Lord will sort it out. Okay. That's a that's a, a major deception within Christianity itself. Well, he's going to close probation and stop it, everything. 
where it's supposed to be. Right, but I'm saying a lot of people, comes. a lot of people have the impression and have been told by their pastors or whoever that don't worry about working on character development, character maturity now, because you're a sinful human being. So just expect to be sinning continually up until the time that Jesus comes. And when Jesus comes, he's going to just flick the switch, and all of a sudden you're going to become a person fit for heaven. Is that is that is that well, what the Bible really teaches? I wouldn't tell. Not that. at all, right? Not That's all. also part and parcel of people that believe that sin is what you do outwardly. Yeah. Though very clearly, <laughs> Scripture is teaching that sin is what we do within the heart mm-hmm. that leads to the outward actions. Mm-hmm. Christ set an example for us in His life, uh, living a sanctified life. Okay. All right. It says no no person can be a Christian without having the Spirit of Christ. If he has the Spirit of Christ, it will be manifest, manifested in kind words and a refined, courteous deportment. External change will testify to an internal change. In other words, a Christian is going to be Christ-like. How was Jesus? He was courteous, he was refined, he was kind, he was long-suffering. Okay. He was stern when he had to be, right? Oh, yeah. Does that mean we have to be that way, or do we have to be striving to be that way? No person can be a Christian without having the Spirit of Christ. If he has the Spirit of Christ, it will be manifested in kind words, refined, courteous deportment, etc. But, think about it. The truth is the sanctifier, the refiner. Okay? So the, the more truth that you have, and come on, we're talking about, we're talking about a growth process. Just like the, you grow physically, you grow spiritually. Okay? So it doesn't, it's not a, a flick of a switch. It happens over the course of a lifetime. Does it doesn't mean that we're to be perfect.